translation purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. King Yudhisthira said, O my lot, I am the most sinful man. Just see my heart, which is full of ignorance. His body, which is ultimately meant for others, has killed many many phalanxes of men. Hmm. Purport. A, sa- a solid phalanx of 21, a solid phalanx of 21, 1,870 chariots, 21,870 elephants, 109,650 infantry, and 65,600 cavalry is called an Okshahini. And many Okshahinis were killed on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. Maharaj Yudhisthira, as the most pious king of the world, takes for himself the responsibility for killing such a huge number of living beings because the battle was fought to reinstate him on the throne. This body is, after all, meant for others. While there is life in the body, it is meant for the service of others, and when it is dead, it is meant to be eaten by dogs and jackals or maggots. He is sorry because for such a temporary body, such a huge massacre was committed. <clears throat> Om Ajnan Timirandasya Gena Jana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Staptitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swam Padanti Kam Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasari Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Hmm. Srila Prabhupada re- re-emphasizes the translation by stating within the purport that this body is meant for others. In other words, it's meant for the service of others. Then the question is, is it my body and does it belong to me or, or does it belong to someone else? If something is meant for the service of others, it belongs to the person you're serving in that sense. Take a look. Uh, we get a body. We don't create our own body. We get our body from our parents, right? We get their body from their parents. And ultimately, as we live life, what do we do with the body? We do it for service of others. Just like a man goes to work and he makes money to serve the family. Right? The woman is home and she's serving the child. The child is thinking it's my body, but actually the body is being taken care of by his mother. If the body wasn't taken care of by the child's mother, the child wouldn't be able to maintain so we see how the body is being used for others and taking care of others. Prabhupada goes on saying, do you live in a particular country and you have to, you know, register yourself as a citizen and then you have some, they have some legal right to use your body in different ways for wars, for taxes and for other services. So you see in so many different ways that what we think is our body actually is not. <laughs> And then if you take it even farther, what are the ingredients of this body? Bhumir apanalu bayu kamana buddhi evacha nahankar iti ame bina prakriti astada. These are the elements make, which make up the body which are coming from Krishna, ultimately. So we're given the body. It's not ours. Although we're in the body and we claim it, just like when you... When you... Uh, rent an apartment. Sometimes you buy one. <laughs> but you can't buy these bodies because it's not permanent. It's a rental program. Only rentals allowed. No purchasing. <laughs> if you want to purchase it, then you have to get another body that lasts and that's not here. So this rental program is that we were given a particular body for a certain time due to our karma. And then after some time we have to give it up. So in that sense, it's not ours because it's given to us. We pay rent. 
The rent is the service we render to others and to ultimately, that service is ultimately meant for the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Therefore, the body ultimately belongs to Him. So in every sense of the word, we can say my body or this is, you know, belongs to so many things or it's my body, but actually it's not when you actually see it. And then when it dies, Prabhupada mentions that it's meant that it's meant for three different uh what we say uh what's the word destinations it turns into ashes stool or dust right you bury it and it turns into dust or it turns into yeah dust turns into dirt and then the insects get it and if you throw it in the street at least in india the vultures get it, and they have a feast, and it's, you know, vulture stool after some time. And then if you burn the body, then it's those who burn the body, they they claim the rights of the body, and it becomes ashes. So, body bowl. My body. So nice. <laughs> so, it's probably said you, you know, you go shopping, and you buy the wrong thing, and then it's no exchange on the on the item. So that's that's material body. You can't trade trade it in, so it's a bad bargain. You bought you got the wrong thing. So what do you do with it? You use it in the service of the Lord. And that's called the best use of a bad bargain. Like that. And then if we're, then it actually has some value, ultimately. So it doesn't belong to us, we can't keep it and it's meant for the service of others. But if we serve Krishna, which is the whole goal of life, then that body actually becomes what we say an opportunity for achieving our spiritual body. And the spiritual body is the real body, which is still with us, but never it's not revealed until we're actually within the pure consciousness of pure Krishna consciousness, then it's revealed. So we're actually that body, but we're encased in this other body. So here we have a situation where King Yudas there. Is he is his lamentation actually valid? Is he actually meant to let lament like that because he sees himself as being responsible for so many deaths of so many husbands? brothers and sons. No women were killed on the battlefield because Prabhupada said in those days, not like today, they just throw bombs in marketplaces and they just bomb cities. The battle was fought away from the general population and so only, only soldiers were involved in the war. That was a, what we say, civilized form of fighting. And, it's, and therefore, there was no innocent people Killed, but so many soldiers were killed, and those soldiers were somebody's son, somebody's brother, somebody's uh, father, like that, somebody's husband. So he's lamenting the loss of all these different personalities, and he's taking on the responsibility. He's besides himself with lamentation, as you, you go, you'll see. He goes on for many, many verses. <laughs> So much so, he doesn't even want to take the responsibility of taking the throne because he feels like it was meant to done at the cost of such hardship and sacrifice for others. But the whole thing was arranged by Krishna. Krishna arranged the whole thing in the sense that he his that he wanted King Yudhisthira to be on the throne. He was the most qualified. He was a devotee of the Lord, and he represented religious principles. He was an instrument in the hands of the Lord for the Lord's plan in order to uh, rule the world with saintly, saintly, popular, saintly rule. So in that sense, we can see also in our situation, whatever we do in Krishna consciousness actually is, is actually meant for the Lord and is empowered by the Lord for us to do that. In and of ourselves, we have some given ability, we have some given talents, we have some given intelligence. And those things can develop as one acts within the categories of these different categories. 
But ultimately, the results is always Krishna. You're out on Sankirtan, and you're trying to sell books. And Krishna sends someone, and, and the person buys a book, and you get the credit. <laughs> Krishna says, oh, this person actually is ready to just receive a book like that. So this is how Krishna, Krishna is always behind the scenes. As he says, ultimately, I am the doer in all cases. So behind the scenes, everything is happening by the will of the Lord. So whether it happens, what we say, uh, piously or impiously, behind the scenes is the will of the Lord, either through the direct will for the saintly and for the devotees, and behind the scenes for the non-devotees through the material energy. But in any case, no one does anything. What is, our, what is the situation of the living entity? We can only desire, that's all. Our desires put our, acti our body into a particular form of action. Desire is a powerful force, and no one can stop desire because desire is life. <clears throat> Sometimes people think, oh, well, let's become desireless. You can become desireless in a material way, or if you want, you can try to rule out all spiritual desires, but no one can be desireless because desire is life. So as soon as there is desire, there's life. As soon as life, there's activity based on that desire. And therefore, everyone is acting simply because of desire. And what's carrying it out is material energy or Krishna through the spiritual energy, either the daivi prakriti or, par, or the apara prakriti. Or it's, um, yeah, it's either done by either of those forces. So what is our situation? When we look at it, we, we're pretty useless. <laughs> Why? Because when you come to the material world, what can you do? You're, at a, you're in a position that there's nothing you can actually accomplish here. You can make a lot of noise, and you build a few houses, and you get some cars, and maybe you get, you know, you get on television or something. But what is the value of such, such gains in the material world? You can have a nice family and so many other things. But unless any of these things are done in the service of the Lord, they're just simply botheration. That's all. They just encumber the material energy more and more. So, so real desire is the desire to serve Krishna, the desire to become Krishna conscious. That's all. Everything else can follow when, when that desire becomes purified. So King Yudhisthira, he's thinking, I didn't desire to be king of the world. But somehow or other, the battle was fought on my behalf. And therefore, I'm responsible for the deaths of so many people. And he's lamenting. Later on, you'll see how Krishna works this situation out. He not, even Krishna doesn't try to convince Yudhisthira that he should stop lamenting. Who, who, who convinces him? Bhishma Dev. And that's the next chapter, what Krishna knows that he has many things. When Krishna wants to do something, he has many reasons to do it. He never does something for one single reason. He accomplishes many things at once. So he wants to glorify Grandfather Bhishma Dev and at the same time uh, enlighten uh, Yudhisthira and what is the reality. And of course, Bhishma Dev just, just congratulates Yudhisthira. doesn't doesn't criticize him or say any, any, he had any kind of responsibility for what happened. It was all the mercy of the Lord, and you got the credit, and therefore you're glorious for taking the position of being the perfect instrument for the Lord's mercy. So this is our position. We can only become an instrument for whatever, uh, for the, whatever the Lord wants. And whatever the Lord wants always happens. Even if it appears that we do something different than what the Lord wants, then he rectifies that by, by changing it around and his, the results ultimately come in time anyway. The living entity can defy the Lord or even go against the Lord or even do something different than the Lord, but in due course of time, everything else works according to the Lord's plan. There's an old saying, time and truth go hand in hand. <laughs> Time and truth go ahead. It's a, it's, a, it's a statement from the Christian tradition, but it has a lot of validity. Just like as we see the situation in the world today, it looks pretty grim in terms of 
how people are treating each other and how people are living and ultimately how, how the society is actually becoming more and more accepting sinful life as a way of life. But this will also be dissolved in due course of time as Lord Chaitanya's movement continues to grow. And that's the Lord's, that's the Lord's arrangement. In the Bhagavatam in the 8th canto, you see a particular incident. There is a huge fight between the demons and the demigods. And, but the demons are, have an advantage. They have one person called Maya Dhavan. And he's a mystic and he's a yogi. And he has created this elixir of immortality. So every time a demon dies, becomes killed in the battle, he's thrown into this, pot, this pond of elixir. He comes out and he's more stronger than he was before he was killed. So the demigods are frustrated. They're killing the demons and the demons are coming back even more stronger. So they don't know what to do. So finally there's some organization and they decide to go to Lord Brahma. And Lord Brahma, they pray to Lord Brahma to please help rectify the situation. Ultimately we're going to be defeated. We are being defeated. So Brahma talks to Shiva and together they make a plan. And one becomes a cow and one becomes a calf. <laughs> And they go to where the elixir are and they start drinking it. <laughs> and then the Maya Dhanava, he sees what's happening. And what does he do? He said, this is the plan of the Lord. And Prabhupada writes in the particular purport, he says, you may plan something and I may plan something, but what really matters is Krishna's plan. So devotional service really means to try to understand what is the plan of the Lord. Ultimately, the Lord's plan is that he wants everyone to become fully Krishna conscious. And that's his desired plan. But in the, to get to the long-range plan, there are intermediate plans. And that's where we fit in, to try to find out how we can bring about that long-range plan in bringing about, what we say, Krishna consciousness to every living entity. Because that's the only plan of the Lord. So anytime someone has made Krishna consciousness, Krishna conscious, the Lord becomes, what we say, satisfied like that. So if we can become an instrument for helping the Lord in his ultimate plan, bringing others to Krishna consciousness, then the body has real substance, it has real value. Then we live for Krishna and Krishna lives with us like that. Of course, in any devotional service, Krishna is always there, inspiring and empowering devotee. But, a devotee, but ultimately, it all, it's all ge geared into bringing more and more people to Krishna consciousness. Whether we're cooking, whether we're cleaning, whether we're you know, fixing automobiles, or whether we're, whatever we're doing must be done or should be done in, in the mood of preaching. What does that mean? That means it's done in the best possible way so others can appreciate it and become inspired by that. And ultimately it develops into becoming a successful endeavor where more and more people are attracted to Krishna consciousness. Just like if you keep the bathrooms clean. <laughs> That's preaching. <laughs> yeah. I was one, there was one, one very senior... Uh, sannyasi in our movement, he went to another religious tradition and he, when he walked into the bathrooms, he couldn't believe it. It was immaculate, so clean. So immediately he was thinking, they must have some substance here. So when people see that, they want to investigate. Oh, this place is so clean. What to think of these devotees? They must be really, really, you know, expert at doing so many things, not only cleaning. So the expertise that we try to, what we say, acquiesce when we put into our service is a sign of bhakti and it's a sign of preaching. Just like we have so many beautiful paintings on the walls. Prabhupada says these are windows into the spiritual world. <laughs> you can see the spiritual world through the, through the creative artistic devotional ability of the devotees. And when people see that, they become attracted and they become, what we say, 
Krishna conscious to some degree. And the more they follow it, you're doing deity worship. If you do it with such precision, the deities are dressed so nicely, the altar is kept so clean. Everything is done in the best possible way. That was Prabhupada's, uh, what we say, desire. To, to make every, because every, he felt everything is for Krishna. Everything is for Krishna. Therefore, we can't really do anything in a less quality because it's for Krishna. But somehow or other, if we try to do things in the best possible way, and they come out a little less, still it's bhakti. But that's just a learning experience, which helps us to gain the under, understanding how to do it better next time. How to do it better next time. A cook should think, oh, I'm cooking, but let, next time when I cook, I'm going to make it better. Or you think of different ways how to make the preparation better. Thinking when you're out there distributing books, you think, how can I reach different kinds of people with different ways to approach people who have a certain mentality? So it's always like a thought in how to present Krishna consciousness in, in a better and more attractive way. This is preaching like that. So this is the mood. And you know what makes that? It makes it exci exciting. Because if we go through, when we routinely go through our service, we can get mechanical. We can become mechanical. But if we do everything with that mood, like, let me do it even better. Just like example of how Prabhupada... Prabhupada, he didn't have a desk, he had a trunk when he first came. He had a metal trunk. And on the trunk he kept his personal belongings that he needed for writing and for recording and other things. And so, Prabhupada would, you know, he'd have his pencil in one place, and he'd have a pad of paper in another place, and there was a light in another. And so everything that he had on the desk was arranged in a particular place. If someone used something and put it back in another place, he would take it, put it back in that place. It was Prabhupada. Watching Prabhupada was like watching a swan. He was like so graceful. And everything he did, one time when he was offering arti um, to, the, to, I think it was the, his spiritual master, and he was standing there doing the arti, Tulsi Devi was on the other side, and they had forgotten to put a cup for the water when Prabhupada offered the water. So there was no cup. So not wanting to stop the arti, so Prabhupada went like this, and the water went right on Tulsi Devi. No drops hit the floor. Not one drop hit the floor. It was like one straight stream. He did it in such a... Nobody knows how it happened. It just The stream went and it just landed on Tulsi. And Prabhupada didn't even phase any... Prabhupada, he just went back. It was like an ordinary thing, you know. It's not that like he smiled and, you know, made a few bows. <laughs> he was just like... This was like normal, you know. So that was Prabhupada. You know, he, he, watching Prabhupada was like watching the most graceful swan perform their movements. It was so wonderful. And that's how Prabhupada did everything. Yeah. So he was trying to also show the example that everything, everything is for Krishna. So everything should be done in the best possible way. And in keeping that mood, then actually devotional service becomes what we say, exciting. Exciting. How to clean the room even better. How to, you know, how to chant, of course, how to chant Japa better. How to understand Bhagavatam better. How to do Kirtan better. How to, everything. How to sit in a lotus position while in class better. <laughs> There's so many things. Jai Sisi Radha Gokulananda. But I must actually say, as a personal expression, the altar always looks so nice here. So you can see that, I mean, it's always, always so beautiful and nicely arranged. The mood of expertise and the decorations and everything looks ideal. So you can see there's an eye for, there's an eye for artistic arrangement, there's an eye for bhakti. And that's nice, you know, when people come and take darshan, 
you know, people come for the first time. They may not even know what's happening, but still that they're they're attracted by the beauty and the art artistic arrangement. So that's Krishna consciousness, like that. So that's what Prabhupada was teaching us. So everything, if we you, if we have that consciousness, or try to do everything in the best possible way, I'm not up to that standard, but I'm just I'm seeing that when we try to make that effort, it becomes Krishna consciousness never becomes old or boring. It becomes exciting. Everything you do, <laughs> you know, everything you do is becomes interesting. Why? Because it's all meant for Krishna. In other words, all men for Krishna's service. So King Eunice there, he feels like he's been uh, acting in a way that is not beneficial for others. But later on we'll see, Krishna reveals everything. So the plan of the Lord is always perfect. And everyone is working according to plan. Even the, even the non-devotees, are they working to the plan of the Lord? What does Krishna say in the Gita? Everyone, as they surrender unto me, I reward you and kill. Everyone follows my path. What is he saying, surrender unto me? Does he mean bhakti? Not necessarily. Everyone is surrendered either to his material energy or to the or to the spiritual energy. So no one can be not surrendered to one of those two energies. So everyone is following his path, either direct, spiritual, indirect, material. So ultimately, everyone is working under the control of the Lord. And through the material energy, he's giving people the results of their activities. And what we say, they're getting happiness materially, distress, more a combination of both. And they're becoming more and more overcome by the, the, the activities of the material energy. They're becoming entangled. But for the devotees, the devotees are actually becoming free from that entangled because they serve the daivi shakti or the material, the spiritual energy. Therefore, they're on their way back to the spiritual world. But no one can be outside of the control of the Lord at any time, every, anywhere. Everything is working under Krishna's control, directly or indirectly, like that. So Yudhisthira has nothing to lament about because this was Krishna's direct will and using him as the instrument, like that. And in the other sense, when something does, we do something and we get some credit for it, what do we think? Oh, but ultimately, it's the, it's the grace of the... What does Krishna say in the Bhagavad Gita? Rasoham apsakuntiya prabhasmi sarisuriya pranava sarvavedeshu sabdike purusham nishu that Pusabdike Purusham Neshu means I am the ability in all living entities. And he also says, Sarvasya Jaham Dridisani Vistamata Smita Gyanam Apohanam Cha. If you want to remember me, I help you. If you want to forget me, I also help you. And if you want knowledge, that I also help you get that knowledge. So we get by our desire, and the Lord supplies. So therefore, ultimately, Everything is in, under his control. Like that. We may desire in a certain way and get something different. What does that mean? That means you weren't qualified to get that or ultimately Krishna wanted to give you something else. <laughs> so in other sense, when you see our situation, all we can do is ultimately serve the Lord because ultimately, even though, even the materialists are serving the Lord, but what do they get? They get suffering because they're serving the Lord's external energy, Maya, Maya Devi. Maya, Prabhupada said, Maya is like a, you know a wrestler. You go into the ring and she just beats you up. That's all. <laughs> and you try to wrestle with Maya. She's pretty good. She, she she's won so many matches already. She, she doesn't lose. <laughs> so yeah. So depends on what energy you want to connect with. <laughs> The more we connect with the spiritual energy, the more our consciousness is happy and uplifted in devotion to Krishna. And the more we connect with the material energy, the more we struggle simply to live in this world. That's why Prabhupada said, material life is simply a hard struggle for existence. 
even the little ant has to struggle to find his little piece of sugar. So, yeah, everyone in the material world is struggling. But a devotee doesn't have to struggle because all he has to do is try to serve the Lord and the Lord provides whatever is needed. Therefore, a devotee's life is happy. It's simple, like that. And the more we try to serve the Lord in the best way, the more we can actually attract more and more people to Krishna consciousness. And that is what, that is desirable. Okay. So, any questions or comments?